Okay, so today we're going to be going over metabolic disorders from the NCCPA blueprint for the pants. And this is from the GI section, which is 9% of the pants. And this is going to involve G6PD deficiency, Paget's, phenylketonuria, and rickets. So let's get started with G6PD deficiency. What this is, is a genetic disorder that causes breakdown of red blood cells in response to some form of oxidative stress, which we'll go over the causes. And this is going to lead to episodic hemolytic anemia. So who is at risk? Who are the people that are most commonly affected by G6PD deficiency? Well, first is going to be males because this is an X-linked recessive disorder. So males are going to be much more commonly affected. And then African-American, um, especially African-American males, about 10% will be affected with G6PD deficiency. Another thing that you need to know, those are going to be your two most important as far as risk factors. You need to look for those in the vignettes. Um, they're always going to kind of lead you on the trail for these things um, to pick out the clues for what uh, you know disease they're talking about. Another thing that you need to know as well is areas where malaria is more prevalent, you're going to see higher rates of G6PD deficiency. So Africa, Asia, Middle Eastern countries, and the reason for that is because um, the same individuals that who have inherited or developed the mutation in red blood cells to protect against, protect against malaria also develop this G6PD deficiency um, that leads to the breakdown of red blood cells from oxidative stress. So that's important to know that it actually coincides with um, the malaria um, protection that these individuals have, but they also have this G6PD deficiency. So know that as well, it's important. And as far as the patho, so G6PD deficiency, or I'm sorry, G6PD is an enzyme that protects red blood cells from damage. And they do this by turning something in the body called NADP to something else called NADPH. Now, NADPH is a molecule that generates free radicals and immune cells and protects the red blood cells from oxidative stress. So if patients um, don't have G6PD or don't have enough of G6PD, they can't create this NADPH and they can't protect themselves against oxidative damage or oxidative risk to the red blood cells. And these patients, um, when they do have this damaged red blood cell, leads to denatured hemoglobin, which is also known as Heinz bodies, which is very important for you to know that key term. So Heinz bodies is what happens to these red blood cells in these patients. Um, there's three main causes that you need to know. The most important or the most common cause is going to be infection. So by far the most common cause, and that can be a patient in DKA, pneumonia, whatever it is, infection, because of the inflammatory response in a patient that has an infection, this leads to oxidants such as neutrophils, hydrogen peroxide, um, which can all produce an oxidative challenge to red blood cells and lead to these, um, these oxidative um, stresses and which can lead to the episodes of hemolytic anemia. Second cause that you need to know is going to be some medications. Some medications can lead to this oxidative stress to the red blood cells, dapsone, sulfa medications in, in higher doses, um, primaquin, nitrofurantoin are all pretty common medications that can lead to these oxidative stresses and causes of in these patients. And then finally, fava beans, also known as broad beans. And this is kind of a weird one, but the reason why is because these fava beans contain proteins called visine and covacin, um, which actually prevent the bean itself from rotting. But in the body, they undergo rapid oxidation and it can lead again to this oxidative stress. So these are all reasons that these patients are um, exposed to oxidative stress, where in a normal patient would be no big deal. But in these patients, it's going to lead to episodic hemolytic anemia. So those are your most common causes. Infection is going to be the big one. As far as how the patient's going to present, well, if they're not during an episode of, of being exposed to oxidative stress and having hemolytic anemia, they're going to be asymptomatic. So most of the time they will be asymptomatic. But if they are going through a period of hemolytic anemia, they're going to have symptoms consistent with hemolytic anemia. So what are those symptoms? Well, jaundice is a big one. And that's from uh, during hemolytic anemia, the red blood cells are broken down and they produce bilirubin as a byproduct. And uh, a buildup of bilirubin in the blood is going to cause and lead to jaundice. Another one is going to be dark urine. This is from the intravascular hemolysis, all being flushed out through the urine. It's going to make it a darker color. Um, splenomegaly, again, the spleen plays a big part in hemolysis um, in clearing out um, all of these, uh, these damaged red blood cells. And then these patients also may have back pain. And the reason for that is because all of these red blood cells being broken down in the body are being filtered out by the kidneys. And this can actually lead to an acute kidney injury. So you have this trauma to the kidneys and this can lead to pain in the back and the flank 
So that's another one that you need to know in patient presentation as well. As far as diagnosing these patients, um, you're first going to get a peripheral smear. And what the peripheral smear is going to show is Heinz bodies, which we went over before. So this is just clumps of denatured hemoglobin that's attached to the erythrocyte cell membrane, and it's left over from the oxidative injury. So you're going to see those in the red blood cell. And this is what that looks like. It's just kind of these little dots, and that's the denatured hemoglobin within the red blood cell. So that's what that looks like. And that's, uh, that's something you need to know for the exams because they'll certainly ask you about, they may not say the word Heinz bodies, but they will say denatured hemoglobin. You need to know what that's being caused from in these patients. Another thing that you're gonna see on a peripheral smear is something called bite cells. Um, and schistocytes is just a broad term that basically means a fragmented red blood cell. It can be a number of different causes, but with bite cells, this is gonna be um, red blood cells with literally bites taken out of them. And this is where the spleen removed the, the denatured hemoglobin or the Heinz bodies. And the way I remember that is uh, Heinz ketchup. You just think of like putting Heinz ketchup on these red blood cells makes them more delicious and the spleen just wants to take a bite out. So that's how I remember that. And this is what they look like. It literally just looks like a bite taken out of a red blood cell. And that's from the spleen taking a chunk out of the, the denatured hemoglobin trying to clean up the red blood cell. So that's what you're going to see on a peripheral smear. As far as your labs, again, they're going to be consistent with hemolytic anemia. So what you're going to see with hemolytic anemia, and you need to know this because this presents in other things you need to know when you see a lab presenting this way, you're going to see three main things. You're going to see increased reticulocytes. And reticulocytes are baby red blood cells. So they're immature red blood cells. And this is due to the fact that all of these red blood cells are being broken down and dying off in the body and is rapidly increasing production of red blood cells. So you have all of these new immature red blood cells in the body. Um, you're also going to have increased indirect bilirubin. This is just from the breakdown of red blood cells. And then finally, you're going to have decreased haptoglobin. So haptoglobin is um, something that helps to clear free hemoglobin from destroyed red blood cells. It's produced in the liver. And during hemolytic anemia, the liver can't keep up and produce enough of these to keep up with all the demand. So there's all these dead red blood cells. The, the liver's pumping out haptoglobin to clear them all up, but it can't keep up with the demand. It's using all of them up so quickly, and you're going to have decreased haptoglobin. So remember these three labs because you need to know that these are labs that are going to present in hemolytic anemia, and you're going to see these in other um, diseases as well. So definitely know those. As far as treating these patients, um, normally it's self-limited. Treat the underlying cause of the, if an infection, DKA, whatever it is, just treat the infection. Or if it's a medication that's causing it, discontinue the medication. Um, if it's a, a severe case, you might need to have them on dialysis or things like that if they do have an acute acute kidney injury. And then supplementation of folic acid is important as well. And this is because due to the increased rate of red blood cell production, this can actually lead to folic acid depletion. So you want to make sure these patients are um, supplemented with folic acid. So that's why you do that in these patients. So that's G6PD deficiency. Now, how do I remember some of those important things for that? So I have a little mnemonic that I made that I think helps remember some of the more important ones. And G6PD deficiency leads to episodic hemolytic anemia. So take anemia, grab those letters from anemia, and then we're going to break each one down. So African-American, remember, most common in African-American race, about 10% of African-American males. Nitrofurantoin, this is going to be one of the most common medications that can cause this episodic hemolytic anemia. That's what G6PD deficiency leads to. M is going to stand for males. Remember, X-linked recessive, more common in males. Medications, this is one of the more common causes. I stands for infection, which is going to be your most common cause. And then A is going to stand for avoid offending agent, which is normally going to be um, one of your common treatments because if they're taking a medication or or the uh, the food, the fava beans are going to discontinue the avoid the offending agent. So that's how I remember some of the main key points of G6PD. So moving on to Paget's disease. Um, Paget's disease is going to be this abnormal osteoclastic and osteoblastic activity. This is going to lead to abnormal bone remodeling, and you're going to wind up with these long bone and skull deformities. Um, and the bones keep getting larger and larger from this hyperactive breakdown and rebuilding of bone, which creates large but ultimately weak and fragile bones since osteoblasts can't keep up with the osteoclast activity. So really quick, just as a quick refresher, if you don't remember what osteoclast and osteoblast stand for, osteoclast has a C. So this is going to be consuming bones. 
this is uh, the body breaking down the bone to rebuild it and sometimes to uh, regain some of that calcium if the patient's deficient. And then osteoblast or osteoblastic activity is a B, so that's building bones. So that's just a quick refresher because that's what's going on in pages. You have an increased rate of both of these going on in the body. Um, so as far as the patient presentation, most patients are actually going to be asymptomatic, around 70%. And this may just be an incidental lab finding. It may be found on an x-ray that you take in these patients, but a lot of them are going to be asymptomatic. When patients do have symptoms, bone pain is going to be the most common. And this is normally due to microfractures in the irregularly formed bones. They may also have spinal stenosis, which is pretty common in Paget's disease as well. So bone pain is going to be your most common symptom if they are having symptoms. <clears throat> They also ha may have some bony deformities, bowing of the legs, normally around the, um, the long bones of the femur, around that area. And then they may also have frontal bossing, which is this growth or protuberance of the skull in the forehead location. So those are some things that you may see in the deformities. And then involvement is going to be most common if these patients do have deformities in the femur and pelvis, <clears throat> then about 75% of patients in the skull and about 37% of patients. So that's going to be the most common areas that you're going to see this. Um, and this is just a picture of the, uh, the, the, the bowing that you can see in the legs and it's pretty severe. You can see in some patients as well. So that's just what that may appear on a patient that has this, um, hearing loss is another one that you may see with Paget's disease patients. And this is because, um, there's a decrease in bone mineral density of the, um, the capsule of the cochlea. And remember, this affects all bones, and a cochlea is a bone, so it may actually affect the, the mineral density. And another reason, too, is, is there's com there may be compression by surrounding bones of cranial nerve 8, which, remember, controls our hearing. So hearing loss may be seen in these patients as well. So those are some important um, things you need to know as far as how the patient's going to present. As far as diagnosis, it's pretty straightforward. You're basically going to look at labs and x-rays, and labs is going to be pretty easy to remember. It's just increased alkaline phosphatase. Everything else is going to be normal. Uh, your calcium, your PTH, your phosphate are all going to be normal, and just the alkaline phosphatase is going to increase. And this is due to the increased osteoblastic activity. Alkaline phosphatase is attached to osteoblasts and they're released during osteoblastic activity. And there's increased osteoblastic activity, so you're going to have this increased um, output of alkaline phosphatase. As far as x rays, there's a couple things you'll see on x ray. You may see increased tra uh, trabecular markings um, during the sclerotic phase. Um, and then another thing that you can see too is called a cotton wool appearance on skull radiographs. So this is what that looks like. And this is due to the thickened and sclerotic patches of bone around the skull. And you can see pretty how, you know, how, how dramatic that can be in a patient with, um, with Paget's disease. So those are the things you're going to look for as far as diagnosing these patients. And then as far as treatment, if they're asymptomatic, you're just going to observe. And if you do need to treat them, the first line agent is going to be bisphosphonate. So really easy Paget's disease treat, uh, treatment and diagnosis. So diagnosis, basically look for that increased alkaline phosphatase. You may do some imaging. And then treatment, if you do give them a medication, it's going to be bisphosphonate. So your alondronate and all of those. So pretty straightforward with Paget's. Um, and then I came up with this too. Just remember a few of the important things with Paget. So P stands for pain in bones, which is going to be your most common symptom. Uh, symptom. A stands for <clears throat> alondronate, because remember, that's going to be um, your bisphosphonate. That's a medication from that class. G stands for giant bones. Remember, your bones are going to get enlarged and, and really big in these patients. E stands for elevated alkaline phosphatase. It's going to be your lab finding. And then T stands for trouble hearing. Those. So that's just some ways to remember some of the things you'll see in pages. Uh, moving on to phenylketonuria. This one's a little bit more involved, but still pretty straightforward for the most part. Um, so this is going to be an autosomal recessive disorder that results in decreased metabolism of something called phenylalanine. And this is going to lead to an accumulation of phenylalanine in both the blood and the urine. So let's go over a little bit about why this happens in these patients. So phenylalanine can be toxic to the body in high amounts. But Luckily, the liver in a, in a normal patient is going to create an enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase. And what this does is converts phenylalanine, which can be toxic to the body, into something useful called tyrosine. And tyrosine is an amino acid that's a building block for protein. Um, it's essential for um, neurotransmitter production, and it helps to make uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine. And in patients with phenylketonuria, 
um, their liver isn't producing this phenylalanine hydroxylase. So instead of getting the, the useful amino acid tyrosine, these patients are actually stuck with a harmful phenylalanine. So we'll see some of these symptoms that can um, come as a result of the increased phenylalanine in the body. So how, or I'm sorry, where is, where is phenylalanine found? Well, phenylalanine is mostly found in proteins, so eggs, chicken, pork, um, fish, beans, milk, and it can actually even be found in diet soda. So I don't know if you've ever seen on the side of a bottle or a can of diet soda, you'll see um, warning this contains phenylalanine. And it's actually because of these patients in particular, uh, they really have to decrease or eliminate their dietary intake of this. So that's why you'll see that on some diet soda, but mostly it's going to be found in proteins. As far as how the patient is going to present, there's a few different things that you need to know. Um, intellectual disability, and this is because um, the increased levels of phenylalanine can become toxic, like I went over before. And this can actually affect brain development. So that's something you may see in these patients. Another thing, too, is um, microcephaly. And this is going to be because the, the fetal brain growth is going to be negatively impacted by the increased levels of the, the phenylalanine in the maternal circulation. A couple other things, too, that you may see in these patients is going to be um, light pigmentation of both eyes and hair. So the first two were due to the increased levels of phenylalanine, but this one, the light pigmentation of both the eyes and hair, is actually due to the decreased tyrosine. So these patients are normally going to have these uh, light eyes, light hair, like blonde hair, blue eyes, and it's due to decreased melanin production. So melanin is predominantly synthesized from tyrosine, which these patients don't have. So they're going to be deficient in melanin, and that's why you're going to see this lighter pigmentation in these patients. Um, they also may have seizures, again, due to the high levels of the phenylalanine in the body that can be toxic. As far as diagnosing, um, all newborns here in the United States are going to be screened for PKU normally in the first uh, 24 to 48 hours. Um, it's something called a heel prick test where they take a small amount of blood from the, the newborn's heel and they test for phenylketonuria as well as a few other um, diseases, cysto cystic fibrosis, congenital hypothyroidism. So most patients diagnosed here in the United States will be found within the first few days of life. So this can be treated and to prevent some of these problems. You can also do a quanti uh, quantitative serum phenylalanine. And then another thing that's interesting, we get a urinalysis from these patients. Um, their urine and their sweat are both going to have this musty or mousy odor. And this is due to the excess phenylalanine being flushed out through the urine and it breaks down um, and it's broken down or degraded into uh, something called phenyl, phenylacetic acid, and that has this musty or mousy odor. So that's something else that you may see in these patients as well. As far as treatment, these patients, um, there's a couple of things that you need to know. Obviously, these patients cannot, um, you want to avoid phenylalanine, and then you also need to make sure that you give them tyrosine because they don't have enough of this. So you're going to avoid foods high in phenylalanine. So again, remember that cheese, eggs, fish, um, diet soda because of the aspartame has high levels of phenylalanine. So dietary restrictions for these patients. And then also tyrosine supplementation. They, you need to decrease the phenylalanine and you need to increase the tyrosine. So that's for the most part, all you need to know for treatment. There's another thing too called um, saproterin. And this is something you can give to patients to lower their phenylalanine levels, which kind of allows them for a less restricted diet. So they can have a little bit more of the proteins and things like that. These are like in mild to moderate cases where you can use this medication to help them just so they can have some of those foods back into their diet. That's another thing to know as well. But the main thing is just avoidance of foods high in phenylalanine and the tyrosine supplementation. Moving on to our last one, which is going to be rickets. And rickets is going to be a softening or weakening of bones in children. And it's most commonly due to a vitamin D deficiency. Um, something else important that you should know is that rickets is going to be um, only in children. The adult version of this is called osteomalacia. So remember that we actually at our school got a question wrong because they didn't specify if it was adult or children. And we we said the adult version, so, but anyways, that has nothing to do with this. But remember, rickets is this in children, not in adults. Adults, it's osteomalacia. So there's going to be a deficiency in the mineralization at the growth plates of long bones. Um, and this can lead to bony deformities, growth retardation, 
And just a quick refresher, vitamin D, remember, is responsible for absorbing calcium and phosphorus from the foods we eat. And without vitamin D, these patients don't have enough calcium to deposit and build bone. So that's why you're going to see a lot of the problems in these patients. As far as the etiologies, there's going to be two causes, two ways that this can happen in these patients. One is going to be from a calcipenic cause of rickets. And this is just from a calcium deficiency due to de decreased vitamin D, not being able to... Um, absorb the calcium from the foods we eat because the decreased vitamin D. Another cause or the second cause um, is going to be phospholipenic. So phospholipenic rickets and this is going to be um, renal in origin and it's due to renal phosphate wasting. So those are the two causes um, of rickets in children. And then as far as the presentation, bone pain is going to be um, one of your most common symptoms and this is mostly associated with um, pseudo fractures that can present in these patients. And this is due to a uh, a band of decrease of bone formation and mineralization that can cause calluses at the periosteum and a lot of pain these patients will have in rickets. Another thing that you need to know too is that they may have a delayed fontanelle closure. So they're going to have a soft spot which can be caused by an incomplete closure of the anterior fontanelle. Um, then there's a few other things that you may see as well relating to the, um, the bony deformities. Um, bowing of the femur and the tibia, also known as genuverum. And genuverum is when the knees bow out at the side. So let me show you that here. So the knees are actually bowing out. And there's genuverum and there's genuvergum. Vergum is when the knees are kind of knocking each other and sticking together. And the way you can remember that is if you remember genuverum. So rum, weak at the knees. If you drink rum, you get weak at the knees and you kind of like your legs are all wide and you have this wide stance and then genuver gum you think of gum between your knees making them stick together so that's a way to remember if you ever see it on an exam so these patients are going to have bowing of the femur and tibia known as genuverum so their knees are going to be really wide apart like that um, they also may have developmental delay of motor milestones because of the um, the bony deformities that they have and issues that they're going to see related to that and as far as diagnosis, you're going to be looking at your labs and you're going to be looking at your x-rays. So first with labs, you're going to see a decrease in your calcium. Again, that makes sense. And decreased phosphate um, and decreased vitamin D, which we went over before. So these are going to be all the things that you're going to see decreased in these patients. And then the things you're going to be uh, seeing an increase in is PTH. Uh, I'm sorry, I wrote that twice, but it's supposed to be increased PTH and increased alkaline phosphatase. So increased PTH because they're going to have a decreased calcium. And remember, there's a compensatory mechanism. Anytime your calcium goes down in the body, the parathyroid is going to respond by um, releasing PTH, which is going to try to increase the calcium. So these patients have increased PTH because their calcium is low. The body's trying to compensate. And then the increased alkaline phosphatase, which I obviously did not write there, but that's what I meant to write, is due to Again, what we went over before, the increased osteoblastic activity, high bone turnover. That's why you're going to see increased alkaline phosphatase. As far as your x-rays, um, you're going to be normally x-raying the long bones. So you're normally looking at the, the wrist and the knee to see the epiphyseal plate of the femur and the tibia and between the radius and the ulna and those areas where you're going to be looking at in particular. Um, and this is what you're going to see you're going to see this widening of the epiphyseal plate. So you can see um, on the left here, um, you're going to see a normal patient. And then on the right, a patient with rickets, and you just see this wide open epiphyseal plate in these patients. That's what that's going to look like in patients with rickets. Um, they're also going to have a loss of deformity in long bones. So the cortex can be uh, appear fuzzy. And specifically within the cortex, you're going to see this fuzzy appearance with patients with rickets. And then there's another thing known as rachictic rosary. And this is at the costochondral junction. It's where the ribs meet the sternum. And they actually get enlarged in this junction. And if you look at the thorax of a patient, you know, take a look here. It looks like a line of beads. And if I don't know if you can visualize, but there's a rosary necklace, a rachictic rosary, that looks like this, that, it, that can appear this way, because these kind of look like beads at the costochondral junction, and that's where they got the name from. So that's what rachictic rosary means, if you do see that. It's this costochondral um, junction enlargement with a bead-like appearance.
As far as treatment, it's pretty straightforward. You're really just going to give them vitamin D and calcium supplementation. If they do have severe, um, severe symptomatic hypocalcemia, seizures, cardiovascular instability, they're going to require hospitalization and IV calcium supplementation. But really, it's mainly just going to be your mainstay is going to be vitamin D and calcium supplementation. That's really going to be the best way to treat this. So that is metabolic disorders for the pants. I thank you and I hope you subscribe, like my videos, let me know what you think. And good luck on your pants, your pantry, your EOR, and good luck in PA school.